Iranian protests rage on, and the country's supreme leader fires back. President Trump criticizes the past administration's Iran policy. A new year brings a frenetic dash to pass legislative agenda items, while a retirement announcement could open the door to a familiar face. And you think it's cold now? Wait for the Arctic blast. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Happy New Year. The new year bringing new pressure from the Trump administration on Iran, calling for the world to get behind the protests in that country that threatened to upset the regime. Iran's supreme leader blames, quote, enemies of the country for the deadly uprising. The demonstrations that have lasted nearly a week are the biggest in the country since a disputed election in 2009 and provided an opening for President Trump to hit the previous administration for what he called a lack of action. Correspondent Kevin Cork is at the White House tonight with the latest on this story from a chilly North Lawn. Good evening, Kevin. Chilly indeed. Good evening, Brett. The president uh, threatening new sanctions on the regime in Tehran if they continue the crackdown on the uprising. That crackdown, by the way, has already cost more than 20 lives and more than several hundred people have already been arrested. Now, that threat, however, happens as his administration is speaking with a common voice in support of the Iranian people. It takes great bravery for the Iranian people to use the power of their voice against their government. From the U.N. mission to the State Department. We ought to support them. To the White House. The United States supports the Iranian people. A unified front in support of the Iranian people in the throes of an uprising threatening to topple the rogue regime in Tehran. Years of mismanagement, corruption and foreign adventurism have eroded the Iranian people's trust in their leaders. The Iranian regime spends its people's wealth on spreading militancy and terror abroad rather than ensuring prosperity at home. The White House's call to defend the Iranian people's right to self-determination is taking shape on air and online, with President Trump himself firing a cannonade of tweets that noted the uprising, his support of the Iranian people, and he accused the Obama administration of stabilizing the Tehran regime with $1.7 billion in cash in a settlement of a decades-old dispute back in 2016. All of the money that President Obama foolishly gave them went into terrorism and into their pockets. The people have little food, big inflation, and no human rights. Vice President Mike Pence added, the United States of America will not repeat the shameful mistake of our past. That, a reference to a similar Iranian revolt back in 2009, sparked by the country's disputed presidential election and President Obama's wait-and-see attitude. My hope is that uh, the regime responds not with violence, uh, but with a recognition that the universal principles of peaceful expression and democracy uh, are ones that should be affirmed. Am I optimistic that that will happen? You know, uh, I take a, a wait and see approach. An approach seen by the current administration as grievously ineffective. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. All freedom loving people must stand with their cause. The international community made the mistake of failing to do that in 2009. We must not make that mistake again. Ambassador Haley, very strong there today. Brett, she said the U.S. would seek an emergency session at the U.N. to express support of the people there in Iran. Obviously, that is a position supported by the Trump White House, Brett. More on this with the panel. Kevin, thank you. So what do you think? Do you think the president's pressure on Iran will lead to change? And should it? Let me know on Twitter, at Brett Baer. You can use the hashtag special report or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Brett Baer SR. Senator Orrin Hatch, the longest serving Republican in the Senate and a former boxer, is throwing in the towel. But every good fighter knows when to hang up the gloves. And for me, that time is uh, soon approaching. That's why after much prayer and discussion with family and friends, I've decided to retire at the end of this term. The announcement from 83-year-old Hatch, a seven-term senator from Utah, could set up a run by a very familiar face, one President Trump has seemingly wanted to keep out of Washington. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel joins us now with details, some big news ahead of Congress's return to D.C. You're absolutely right, Brett. Welcome back. Uh, Orrin Hatch's announcement opens the door for former GOP presidential nominee Mitt Romney to run for that seat. 
Romney tweeted, I join the people of Utah in thanking my friend Senator Orrin Hatch for his more than 40 years of service to our great state and nation. For his part, Hatch has nothing but praise for Romney. When asked on special report about Romney's political future, Hatch said he'd, quote, love to see him run for his seat. But President Trump probably doesn't share Hatch's sentiment. Romney has been a frequent and loud critic of the president. White House Press Secretary Sander, Sarah Sanders says President Trump is very sad to see Hatch go. In fact, the president was just in Utah a month ago encouraging him to run again, perhaps hoping to block Romney. Hatch's announcement adds to a busy year in politics and policy. Congress starts 2018 staring at a late night January 19th deadline to fund the government or else there could be a partial government shutdown. I certainly hope it's through the end of the fiscal year. We need to get the, the funding issue solved. We've got a lot of national security requirements that need to be met and uh, we haven't been keeping up with that. A White House official tells Fox Budget Director Mick Mulvaney and White House Legislative Affairs Director Mark Short will meet with the big four leaders of Congress at the Capitol tomorrow. Ryan Pelosi, McConnell and Schumer with a two-year budget cap expected to be a major topic. President Trump is also pressing lawmakers to act on infrastructure, which could attract some bipartisan support. Thank you. The president tweeted today about immigration. He has set a March deadline for lawmakers to resolve it. Democrats are doing nothing for DACA, just interested in politics. DACA activists and Hispanics will go hard against Dems, will start falling in love with Republicans and their president. We are about results. A member of the Senate GOP leadership laid out his vision. That's an issue that, uh, as you know, has to be addressed. I'm hoping that we can move a freestanding bill. But when you address the DACA issue, you have to address the broader issue of illegal immigration. The House Republican whip says Congress must also work on rebuilding the health insurance private marketplace. One of the best things we did is repeal the individual mandate because that really undoes a lot of the stools of Obamacare. Uh, now we need to go and fix the things that are broken and health care jacking up costs. Let's get it done. After very few signs of bipartisanship in 2017, a former aide to Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says there could be a window for the president. He's got opportunities to do something that is bipartisan. It means that he's got to give a little bit. I think a perfect place to start is with DACA, with the immigration. He said on September 5th in a tweet, we're going to solve this with heart and compassion. That window is likely to be very limited with the entire House and one third of the Senate up for re-election this year. So the president's expected to plot strategy with Speaker Ryan and Leader McConnell over the weekend at Camp David. So a lot of speculation about Mitt Romney possibly getting in that Orrin Hatch seat. Uh, just moments ago, his Twitter account had just said Massachusetts for the longest time. Now it says Holiday, Utah. Good catch. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you decide. All right, Mike, thank you. Another power player in Congress will also retire this year. Pennsylvania Re Representative Bill Schuster, chairman of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, says he will not run for re-election. Schuster says he plans to focus this year on working with President Trump on an infrastructure plan not to campaign. 25 House Republicans are giving up their seats this November by either retiring or running for a different office. Democrats need to flip 24 seats to take control, back control of the House. Today also marks Minnesota's Al Franken's uh, last day as senator. He announced his retirement, you remember, last month after several women accused him of sexual misconduct and his Democratic colleagues called for him to resign. In his floor speech last month, Franken denied some of the allegations against him. Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith will replace him until a special election is held this November. Chief Justice John Roberts is promising a careful review of federal judiciary's sexual misconduct policies. In his annual report, Justice Roberts noted that the ju judicial branch is not immune to sexual misconduct in the workplace. His comments come in the wake of a prominent appeals court judge stepping down after he was accused of touching women inappropriately, making lewd comments and showing them pornography. It's January. It's supposed to be cold, right? But I guess there may be many of you out there who wish you were here in a Hawaii today. That right there, temperatures are in the low 80s in Hawaii. That is not the case for those of you who live in Indianapolis, where temperatures dip to a record setting, negative 12 degrees today. And it's not just the Midwest feeling this freeze. Arctic temps are being felt all across the east. It isn't going to get any better anytime soon. 
correspondent Brian Yenis reports on a storm that could bring with it hurricane force winds and a lot of snow. As bitter cold grips much of the nation, wind chill advisories blanket areas from Texas to Canada, causing school closings and forcing people to stay inside. I'm cold, I'm cold. Yeah, so what are you doing to keep warm? I got gloves on, scarf, two layers, uh, long sleeves. Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> it's freezing. It's, it's way colder up here than where we're from. The National Weather Service tweeted, Arctic air mass will bring a prolonged period of much below normal temperatures and dangerously cold wind chills to the central and eastern U.S. over the next week. In Duluth, Minnesota, an area known for cold winters, the wind chill dipped to 36 degrees below zero and the harbor on Lake Superior froze. Temperatures Tuesday ranged from negative nine in Rapid City, Iowa to 25 in New Orleans. And tomorrow, expect temps to reach minus three in Fargo, North Dakota, and a balmy 29 degrees in New York City. The frigid conditions in places like Peabody, Massachusetts, and Indianapolis meant students had the day off. The cold has even reached as far south as Florida, where vacationers had been hoping for a break from the chill. This is a vacation weather. It's freezing. Dozens of record lows have been set with this weather, and more are likely as another Arctic blast descends from Canada toward the end of the week, and with it, another snowstorm. The cold is going to last not only this week, but into, well, the next couple of weeks. We're going to see a little bit of moderation, but the problem is the moderation comes as a potential blockbuster storm could hit the East Coast. As the storm tracks closer to the coast, low pressure could develop it into a powerful nor'easter by midweek, bringing snow accumulation and strong winds. The, the extreme cold hitting most of the U.S. is being blamed for at least nine deaths. It's also causing commuter headaches. At least one commuter ferry service here in New York City was suspended because of icy conditions on the Hudson River. All this as we brace here in the Northeast for yet another Arctic blast. Brett. Wow. We'll see how that looks. Brian, thank you. New fallout over a report that a Trump campaign aide's loose lips set off the entire Russia collusion investigation. Meantime, President Trump calls for another look into the Hillary Clinton email scandal. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris joins us now with this story. Good evening, Catherine. Thank you, Brett. Newly released emails show Clinton aide Huma Abedin sent security passwords for sensitive government networks to her unsecured Yahoo account. In a tweet, President Trump unloaded on Abedin, alleging she disregarded basic security, put classified passwords at risk. And he suggested she should be jailed and once again criticized what he calls the deep state Justice Department, imploring officials to finally act against Abedin, former FBI Director Comey and others. The White House Press Secretary explained. Obviously, uh, the facts of that case are very disturbing, uh, and I think the president wants to make clear that he doesn't feel that anyone should be above the law. April 2016 FBI interview overseen by demoted agent Peter Strzok, who sent anti-Trump text messages, Abedin admitted she routinely forwarded government emails to her Yahoo account for printing. The Abedin emails found on her estranged husband Anthony Weiner's computer are significant because they led the FBI to reopen the criminal investigation 10 days before the election, Brett. So is there more fallout the, over this New York Times story that uh, the Trump campaign ad George Papadopoulos started the FBI Russia probe by talking to the Australians? Well, that's right. Australian media reports today there is anger and frustration over leaks by U.S. officials revealing an Australian diplomat shared intelligence that may have kick-started the FBI Russia probe. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian ambassador to the U.S., Joe Hockey, personally dealt with the FBI over claims the Russians had damaging information on Hillary Clinton. The New York Times first reported that campaign aide George Papadopoulos, who recently pled guilty to lying to the FBI, made the allegations in May 2016 over drinks in London with diplomat Alexander Downer. On Fox Today, a senior House Republican said the report is a distraction from the faulty Trump dossier funded by Democrats. Clearly, people are trying to, to say, oh, don't worry about the dossier. There were these other things. I'm not sure that the Papadopoulos explanation is really any better. In fact, it's probably thinner than even the dossier. I mean, Based on Fox's reporting, a mosaic of intelligence, not a single source, prompted the FBI probe, Brett. Continue to follow it. Kathy, thank you. You're welcome. President Trump has always made his feelings known about Pakistan, but he set off a firestorm in that country Monday with just one tweet. Correspondent Rich Edson looks at the high-powered geopolitical spat. 
in Pakistan anti-American, anti-Trump demonstrations. An emergency government meeting and summoning the U.S. ambassador in response to President Trump's tweet claiming the United States has given Pakistan $33 billion and received in exchange nothing but lies and deceit. The Pakistani government says the president's tweet is, quote, completely incomprehensible as they contradicted facts manifestly. Pakistan says it is deeply disappointed in the president's tweet. The Trump administration says it, too, is frustrated with the relationship. Pakistan has played a double game for years. They work with us at times. And they also harbor the terrorists that attack our troops in Afghanistan. In August, President Trump argued the same points while he detailed his administration's strategy for the region. This week, the administration confirmed it still refuses to send $255 million in aid to Pakistan. A former Trump State Department official says this posture towards Pakistan is overdue. We can also politically, I think, just make it clear that we're shifting away from this government and going to look more toward India as a solution to our problems. Pakistan's government says it has sacrificed tens of thousands of lives fighting terrorism and that quote could not be trivialized so heartlessly by pushing all of it behind a monetary value and that too an imagined one this relationship continues fluctuating in october president trump said pakistan was respecting the u.s again praising its cooperation in freeing an american and canadian couple held there pakistan is also the primary u.s land supply route into afghanistan Pakistan has previously blocked that route, forcing the U.S. to use other Central Asian countries to supply its forces in Afghanistan. Brett? Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thanks. An American soldier was killed, four others wounded during a firefight in eastern Afghanistan yesterday. Sergeant First Class Mihail Golan of Fort Lee, New Jersey, is being remembered for making the ultimate sacrifice in service to his country. South Korean leaders say they will meet with North Korea for talks anytime, anywhere. The proposal coming a day after Kim Jong-un took a softer tone towards a country it's still technically at war with, while also saying it has nuclear weapons and the U.S. in its sights. That's perhaps why, as senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott reports, President Trump has taken the possibility of this historic meeting with a grain of salt. The iconic peace house at the DMZ between North and South Korea could be the scene of more history next week. Seoul is proposing representatives of the two countries meet there January 9th, the first such meeting since 2015. This follows an offer from Kim Jong-un in a New Year's Day message to discuss sending a delegation to next month's Winter Olympic Games in South Korea with the aim of improving relations between the two countries. We welcome that the North Korean leader expressed a willingness to send athletes to the Pyeongchang Olympics and to hold inter-Korea government talks. North Korean ally China jumped at the news. China welcomes and supports North and South Korea to make concrete efforts to better ties. Still, Kim Jong-un also declared North Korea would build up its missiles targeting the U.S. and the nuclear button would always be on his desk. No wonder President Trump's tweet was icy. Rocket Man now wants to talk to South Korea for the first time. Perhaps that is good news. Perhaps not. We will see. Some see the move by Pyongyang as a way to drive a wedge between South Korea and ally U.S. and by North Korea dangerous time. This latest uh, statement by Kim Jong-un about negotiating with South Korea is nothing but propaganda to lull the gullible uh, government of South Korea and a lot of gullible Americans into thinking that there's some kind of opening here. South Korea does hope to delay military exercises with the U.S. until all Olympic-related events are over. North Korea hates the drills. Seoul says along with better relations with Pyongyang, it also wants to resolve the North Korean nuclear crisis. Most experts see little chance of that happening anytime soon. Brett. Greg Palcott in London. Greg, thanks. The first day of the new year brings new laws across the country and a new holiday. Coming up, some of the biggest changes to the books for 2018. A new year means new laws on the books, many of which may affect you. Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt gives us a rundown of some of the biggest changes for 2018. 
Gun owners, minimum wage workers, undocumented immigrants, and in some cases, cats and dogs are among those who will be significantly affected by a raft of new state laws. As California legalizes recreational use of marijuana, it also continues its fight with President Trump over immigration. The state is strictly limiting the extent to which local law enforcement agencies can help federal immigration authorities, making California not officially a sanctuary state, but close to it. And big changes, too, for gun owners in California. They'll no longer be able to buy ammunition online and have it shipped to their home. The minimum wage will be going up by varying amounts in 18 states, including New York, while New Yorkers will also get what Governor Cuomo says is the nation's most comprehensive family leave policy, eight weeks for most workers. Everybody should have the right to be there when their spouse is giving birth. Iowa and West Virginia become the latest states to require voters to show some sort of ID for local elections. Tennessee is reacting to the free speech debate on college campuses by introducing a law saying colleges cannot exclude speakers based on opposition by others to what they might say, a move legal experts say is in line with federal law. The Supreme Court has always said that the answer to speech that you don't like is more speech, not a restriction on speech. Tennessee is also making it legal for barbers to make house calls. And in Illinois, dry cleaners, tailors, and hair salons will now have to present a price list if a customer asks for it. Custody of cats, canines, and any other pet can be considered as part of a divorce starting today. And finally, Illinois has declared August 4th Barack Obama Day. And while I'm honored to share it with the former president in my house, August 4th will always be my birthday. Brett? <laughs> Jonathan, thanks. It happens to be my birthday, too. A uh, good day for the markets on the first trading day of the year. The Dow rose 105. The S&P 500 was up 22 for a record close. The Nasdaq closed above 7,000 for the first time with a big 104-point gain today. Chicago ended 2017 with some grim yet better statistics when it comes to violence in that city. Correspondent Matt Finn takes a look at the numbers and how police are working to drive down crime. A testament to just how bad violent crime is in Chicago, 650 people murdered last year, an improvement from 2016 when killings averaged more than two per day. Shootings also dropped from about 3,500 incidents in 2016 to around 2,800 last year. The greatest improvement happened in Englewood, infamously one of the city's most dangerous neighborhoods. On Sunday morning, drinking coffee and seeing someone with a gun just shooting or sitting on the porch at night after work, listening to music and then hearing shots ring out. Police largely credit the drop in crime to shot spotting technology. Cameras and radar placed atop utility poles that detect gunshots and instantly alert police. Improving response times and potentially capturing shooters on camera. The city's police ranks also increased by 1,100 officers, and the department put an emphasis on community policing. They really have a connection with the community and community organizations, and they're, you know, they don't come around as security. They really come around as a fabric of Inglewood. Like a new state law like also kicked into effect January 1st that going forward will require judges to reveal why they did not give strict sentences to repeat gun offenders. I think that those individuals are clearly showing us they don't want to play by the rules of society, so we should give them some place to sit down. A decrease in violent crime, but still a long way to go in the Windy City, where police and tough neighbors are taking a stand against crime. Most of us are working hard citizens who vote, who are doing things to clean up our block, who just want a safe and walkable community. The drop in violent crime was also seen in New York and Los Angeles. Here in Chicago, it's day two of 2018, and at least three people have already been killed. Brett? Matt Finn in Chicago. Matt, thanks. Up next, how suing the Trump administration brought one unknown politician a lot of fame. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 13 in Tampa, where a Coast Guard crew raced to save the driver of this car before it submerged in a Panama City marina over the holiday weekend. The 89-year-old driver apparently suffered a medical emergency before his car plunged into the water Saturday. Rescuers broke the car's window and pulled that man to safety. 
Fox 5 in New York with the story of a 16 year old boy charged in the deaths of his parents, sister, and a family friend in New Jersey on New Year's Eve. The teen's grandfather and brother were not hurt in that shooting. Investigators have not given a motive for the murders. And this is a live look at San Diego from our affiliate Fox 5. Sunny there, one of the big stories there tonight. A sign welcoming drivers to California that proclaims it as an official sanctuary state, adding felons, illegal immigrants, and MS-13 gang members welcome. Pictures of that sign made rounds on Twitter, but the sign itself has since been removed. No word who may be responsible for that. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. A Washington attorney general was really a no name in national politics and not too familiar in state politics. But then Donald Trump became president. Tonight, correspondent Dan Springer reports on how one man went from near political obscurity to influence and fame by taking the president to task in what critics say is all about that politician's own aspirations. Washington State's Attorney General Bob Ferguson was the most obscure of politicians until Donald Trump became president. Since then, he sued the Trump administration 18 times, including a successful block of Trump's first travel ban. It landed this former Democratic County Council member on Time Magazine's list of the world's 100 most influential people and made him, according to the Seattle Stranger, a heartthrob. Ferguson has taken his newfound fame and is turning it into campaign cash. Over a six-week period recently, he said sent Democratic supporters 12 letters touting his lawsuits and asking for a donation. The result, $305,000 raised. Conservatives see a run for governor and a misuse of office. It would appear that Attorney General Ferguson is using his office for political gain, and it would appear that he's choosing to take on different lawsuits so he can raise money for an inevitable run for governor. He would not be the first. As Texas AG, Greg Abbott sued the Obama administration 48 times. He's now Governor Abbott. Democratic strategists argue President Trump's trampling of the Constitution makes it easy to sue and even easier to fundraise off it. The rest is politics 101. Most of the letters from, from Ferguson throughout this period have included a donate button, which is part of the game and part of the process, but hasn't led with a fundraising appeal. Among the lawsuits filed, stopping Trump directives on ending DACA, banning transgenders in the military, and allowing religious employers to not cover contraceptives. Ferguson has also taken on Education Secretary Betsy DeVos and even spoke at a DeVos protest. State Republicans say it's over the top. When you see the legal referee of the state so blatantly on one side, you ask yourself, well, if I had a case before him, would I get a fair shake? If Attorney General Ferguson declined our request for an interview, but did issue a brief statement saying most Washingtonians support his lawsuits against the president, and he will continue informing them about his work and accepting their contributions. There was no mention about whether he plans on riding this anti-Trump train all the way to the governor's office. Brett? Dan Springer in Seattle. Dan, thanks. A change in management at one major newspaper has given the president an opening to keep up his feud with the press. Fox News media analyst and host of Fox's Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz, joins us with details. Good evening, Howie. Good evening, Brett. It's just the second day of 2018, and President Trump and the New York Times are at it again. The paper's new publisher, A.G. Sulzberger, told readers today that trust in media is declining, blaming misinformation, clickbait, rumor, propaganda, and politicians who are, quote, inflaming suspicion of the press. The president fired back on Twitter. Get impartial journalists of a much higher standard. Lose all of your phony and non-existent sources and treat the president of the United States fairly so the next time I and the people win, you won't have to write an apology to your readers for a job poorly done. Salzburger's dad, the previous publisher, had actually questioned why the paper underestimated Trump's 2016 support but offered no apology. The president told The Times last week that the media basically have to let me win in 2020 because otherwise their ratings are going down the twos. But while few expect journalists to roll over in the next campaign, this president has boosted the financial fortunes of the outlets that cover him. Fox News was the 
number one cable network last year, but MSNBC and CNN also scored record-breaking ratings. And what the president calls the failing New York Times reached three and a half million paid subscribers. The constant coverage was overwhelmingly negative from the start, more than 90% negative in the first 100 days on CNN, NBC, and CBS, a Harvard study found. The president generated some of that himself, accusing Barack Obama of wiretapping him, making divisive remarks after Charlottesville, slamming such pundits as MSNBC's Mika Brzezinski. While journalists were right about some important stories, former aide Mike Flynn pleaded guilty in the Russia probe long after the Washington Post accused him of lying, they have also made high-profile mistakes. CNN fired three reporters over one false story. ABC suspended Brian Ross for another. At year's end, major news outlets did credit Trump with significant achievements, but overall, the critical coverage shows no sign of subsiding, and the president still treats the media as an enemy, and a politically useful one at that. Brett? Howie, thank you. President Trump sent out a slew of tweets this morning and recently, including one in which he seems to take credit for safe air travel last year. The president tweeting today, since taking office, I have been very strict on commercial aviation. Good news, it was just reported that there were zero deaths in 2017, the best and safest year on record. The president didn't say how he has improved airline safety, and the tweet got a lot of reaction on social media. But a new study showed 27 17 was the safest year on record for commercial aviation worldwide. The NTSB reports there has not been a fatal commercial jet crash in the U.S. since 2009. Up next, foreign affairs. Our panel weighs in on the president's handling of the uprising in Iran and the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. First, beyond our borders tonight, Egyptian government officials have extended the nationwide state of emergency first issued by President el-Sisi Last April, the three-month extension was issued after two recent church bombings there. ISIS has led an insurgency across Egypt that has mainly targeted security forces and the country's Christian minority. In Israel, the parliament passed a law requiring a supermajority to give up control over any part of Jerusalem. The move could hamper any future peace deal that involves the city, but since the new law itself can be overturned by a simple majority, it is seen largely as a symbolic gesture. And in London, the new year brought with it stiff fare increases for British rail commuters. Passengers faced a nearly 3.5% hike in fares. The city's mayor led the chorus of criticism, calling the increases eye-watering, given the many delays and cancellations in rail service over the past year there. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders. Tonight, we'll be right back. America longs for the day when Iranians will take their rightful place alongside the free people of the world. The enemy is waiting for an opportunity, for a crack through which it can infiltrate. Look at the recent day's incidents. All those who are at odds with the Islamic Republic have utilized various means, including money, weapon politics, and intelligence apparatus. We must not be silent. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. All freedom-loving people must stand with their cause. The international community made the mistake of failing to do that in 2009. We must not make that mistake again. Trump administration hopping on these protests in Iran, uh, telling the world that they should pay attention. The president tweeting out this morning, the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. All of the money that President Obama so foolishly gave them went into terrorism and into their, quote, pockets. The people have little food, big inflation, and no human rights. The U.S. is watching. With that, let's bring in our panel and start there. Eli Lake, columnist for Bloomberg View. Rachel Bade, congressional reporter for Politico. And Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com. Eli, you wrote a very interesting column today about next steps in this uh, situation. And uh, what about what the Trump administration is doing now and the president's doing? So far, so good. Uh, it's good to see that the president is bringing attention to it and ignoring the advice of some of the Obama administration alumni to be quiet. Um, but this has got to be the beginning of it, and we, we should be realistic. Um, I hope the regime falls tomorrow, but at the same time, 
uh, we should prepare for this the beginning of a longer process and that I think would mean hopefully the State Department will begin to compile the names of people who've been arrested publicize those names in Farsi and I think there's an opportunity for Barack Obama who has a lot of time on his hands right now to become a kind of leader of Western solidarity you know, no Americans going to lead this Iran freedom movement. That's for the Iranians. But there are things that uh, a charismatic figure, an ex-president like Barack Obama, can do um, to call attention to their plight, to lead boycotts of businesses that are do, that, that do business with Iran when they're political prisoners in jail. And well, here's think, Barack Obama back yeah. in 2009, the last time there were significant yeah. protests in Iran. It's up to the Iranian people to make a decision. We are not meddling. I take a, a wait and see approach. And basically, that's what happened. The administration said, we're not going to get involved. We think it's going to be harmful to their efforts. But in the reality, there was in the back of the picture this Iran nuclear deal that they really wanted to push through. That's absolutely right. And more importantly, when he did speak out about the protests, he never did what the protests asked him, which is to recognize that there was a stolen election in 2009. Um, and I think that that is something, this is like an opportunity for Obama to rehabilitate his reputation and make up for that mistake in 2009. Not to say that his support would have made a difference necessarily, but um, you know, as a low moment in my opinion in terms of U.S. foreign policy. Rachel, what about uh, the president here uh, obviously stepping out and, and saying that these protests should, should be watched, but for his base and, and in this election that we just witnessed last, you know, in 2016, uh, he wasn't talking about getting involved in places. Right. And for some of the people who elected him, maybe this is a little not what they were buying. Yeah, I think the big question is what's next? Is it just going to is it going to stop with a tweet and sort of giving a shout out to these protesters or is he prepared to go further than that? There's talk right now about uh, bringing in, you know, the National Security Council at the United Nations Security Council and bring them in to say what can we do about Iran and what can we do about these protesters? There are some people um, in the Obama administration who are saying that if you know, if the United States comes out and supports these protesters very adamantly, that the leaders of Iran will say, look, this is something that was inspired by the United States. They're already sort of latching on to this and saying, these are outsiders, these aren't real folks in Iran, which we know is not the case, of course. But there's sort of that backlash. It will be interesting to see how they sort of balance those two things. All right, here's Ed Royce. Uh, he has, uh, the president does, has support on Capitol Hill. We should be supporting the Iranian people who want a better life, who want more freedom, instead of suffering under the brutal repression of an ideologically inspired hateful regime. We have no will towards the Iranian people. It is their government that gravely threatens us and threatens our allies. Of course, the Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Well, Brett, to your earlier question about the meddling and what Trump, the president campaigned on and not wanting to get involved, he sees this as in the U.S. interest for a couple of reasons. The first is a terrorism aspect. Iran is, as we know, a huge state sponsor of terrorism. We saw Nikki Haley's presentation earlier this year, or last year, rather, about them uh, attacking a, an air, air, airport in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the other thing, too, is he has to make peace with this nuclear deal or not, and that deadline is coming up. And this actually gives him leverage. The administration was ready for the protests like this to happen. All of them were on the same page in terms of messaging. You had the president coming out with his tweets, Nikki Haley on the same page as the State Department, obviously, but their messages came out at the same time, and the White House came out immediately in support of these protesters, which is a 180-degree turn from where the Obama administration was. He's not doing this as a meddling tactic. He is doing this because he believes it's in the American interest in the Middle East to redo the map there, to talk about to the Saudis, get the Saudis back on the same page, and to talk to the Egyptians and the Israelis about stopping the Iranian terrorism that we've seen for so many years. In the meantime, he's also pressuring Pakistan, uh, saying they need to do more on terrorism. And just in the past few minutes, uh, the Palestinians. And he said, it's not only Pakistan that we pay billions of dollars to do for nothing, but also many other countries and others. And as an example, we pay the Palestinians hundreds of millions of dollars a year and get no appreciation or respect. They don't even want to negotiate a long overdue do peace treaty with Israel. We have taken Jerusalem, the toughest part of the negotiation, off the table, but Israel for that would have 
had to pay more. But with the Palestinians no longer willing to talk peace, why should we make any of these massive future payments to them? Now, I said that what he campaigned on was different as far as interacting. This is actually what he talked about a lot was not paying um, foreign donations, in essence, by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, I, if I may, it sounds satisfying, uh, that tweet, and I can understand why many Americans would empathize. But the U.S. gets a lot out of, you know, propping up the Palestinian Authority, which is the fact that Hamas is not taking over the West Bank at the moment, uh, since they already control Gaza. So it is in America's interest to continue to pay the Palestinians, even though um, I think Trump is largely right that they are not, they've recently not been paying the U.S. a lot of respect. But I think there are serious questions about where that money is being used, and the president is trying to take a different approach about just handing out the check because every administration has been doing that. For example, the Palestinian Authority pays terrorists and their families for murdering Israelis and Americans. That's why the Taylor Force Act was introduced on Capitol Hill, and we'll see where that goes this year, if anywhere at all. But there are questions that Americans have about where their money is being spent, and there is an argument to be made that, yes, there are investments made, although over the world, but what are they getting in return, and is it being harmful towards their interests? But by saying this about Pakistan and the Palestinians, he is essentially trying to get a policy objective by throwing this out there, saying the money can dry up. Right. I think um, it's really interesting that he started the new year with these tweets, right, totally changing U.S. policy when it comes to Pakistan. Um, this is particularly noteworthy because the United States Pakistan has been a number one ally of the United States in terms of fighting terrorism. But people have long known that there are pockets of Pakistan that do harbor extremism. I mean, that's where Osama bin Laden was hiding. So he's pointing to that. He's saying, you guys got to get tougher, and other they might lose their foreign aid otherwise. All right. Coming up, we've got the president's agenda up on Capitol Hill and a surprise retirement today. president hasn't even been in office for a year. And look at all the things that he's been able to get done by sheer will in many ways. And I just hope that we all get behind him every way we can, and we'll get this country turned around in ways that will benefit the whole world, but above all, benefit our people. Well, the celebration at the White House, remember that, Senator Orrin Hash giving the president a lot of praise there. The president referencing that today on news that he is going to retire, Senator Hatch is. Congratulations to Senator Orrin Hatch on an absolutely incredible career. He's been a tremendous supporter. I will never forget the beyond kind statements he has made about me as president. He's my friend, and he will be greatly missed in the U.S. Senate. And of course, this opens the door to the possibility of the former GOP nominee, Mitt Romney, becoming a nominee for the U.S. Senate. Uh, Rachel? Big deal today, but kind of expected. Yeah, definitely. We've been hearing rumors about this for several weeks, a couple months now. Um, listen, Hatch was first elected in 1977. He's been there for four decades, and you just saw um, a recap of probably his crowning achievement, getting tax reform passed as the chairman of the um, Financial Services Committee in the Senate. The big question I have is, uh, what is the dynamic going to be like between Mitt Romney when he runs for the seat and President Trump, who tried to keep Hatch to continue and run again in this position because he didn't want to see Romney in the Senate. So that's going to be quite awkward. It is an interesting dynamic. I mean, he did court Mitt Romney, obviously, for Secretary of State, Eli. Yeah, I think Mitt Romney, if I would imagine he's still very popular in Utah. Utah almost didn't go for Trump. Mitt Romney will have an opportunity to kind of have a second act or third act in American political life. Um, I think he'll be a, a force of something between the never Trump and the loving Trump all the time, and uh, it'll be really interesting to watch him. Yeah, and obviously there's yeah. a primary potential and all kinds of things are up in the air, but uh, Mitt Romney changing his, his Twitter account from Massachusetts to Utah kind of gives you a little signal there yeah. of what's to come. What about the agenda coming up? We have a frenetic pace here to January 19th when the government and essentially runs out of money. Right. We're facing another fiscal cliff, but there's a whole bunch of things. Right. The president will be meeting with Paul Ryan this weekend and Mitch McConnell at Camp David to go over and reconcile their agenda for the coming months. But as you said, the budget is the most important thing. Uh, Democrats have a chance to get more involved here. And going into 2018, they're going to have to figure out what they can campaign on rather than just being against Trump. Um, and the president is going to have to decide what he thinks he can get passed with that 51 vote threshold. And I think we'll see him calling for Mitch McConnell eventually to change the rules so they can get some things done. I mean, take a look at this list. The spending bill, 
the January 19th I mentioned. Uh, you have the legislative fix for DACA, infrastructure plan that is being talked about, um, welfare reform, and obviously all ha all has to be done uh, or wants the president wants it to be done before the midterm elections, Rachel. Yeah, I would look at um, the Republican agenda in 2018 sort of like two different ways. The first way is the must-pass legislation that you're talking about, the budget, how do you fund the government, what's going to happen with DACA and all these dreamers here in the country, um, the debt limit. These are things that the base is not going to be excited about doing because they need Democratic votes, which means they're going to have to give Democrats something to get them to vote for these things. The other piece of this is what they want to do, welfare reform, entitlement reform, um, and also infrastructure. Those both have steep challenges uh, for opposite reasons, actually, but I'm very skeptical that they can get either of those passed next year, too. Well, it's interesting. Paul Ryan talked about doing the entitlement stuff. Mitch McConnell said, no. Nah. <laughs> so. Exactly. I think one thing to really look at here is whatever happens with the Mueller probe, because if the Mueller probe peters out or doesn't deliver impeachable goods, so to speak, then I think at that point there's going to be a lot of Democrats who are going to reassess whether or not they can work with Trump. If he does infrastructure, that's a Democrat agenda. A lot of Republicans are going to be uneasy about that, and it's going to give the president more leverage, but he needs to figure out, like, this kind of thing that's hanging over him, we need to get a resolution on that before we can really figure out if we can get his agenda. And we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Panel, thank you. When we come back, proof that love sometimes hurts. Finally tonight, the ice rink at Rockefeller Center is a popular place for marriage proposals in New York City. You may not have known that, but it is. It has its pitfalls, as New Jersey resident Brian Scholar and his girlfriend Amanda Szymanski found out. Everything is going fine. They get out there on the ice. The plan, right, when Brian in front of the big tree there, everybody's around. He gets down on one knee. Everybody goes crazy. He asks her to marry him. She says yes. And then, yeah, she takes a little bit of a spill there. She was okay amid the roar of the crowd. She called it a truly magical fairy tale moment, <laughs> and she will remember it forever. Congratulations. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. The story, hosted by Sandra Smith, starts right now.